So last week we finished the study of uh, Fourier series for continuous time uh, periodic signals. And we learned a few properties associated for the convenience of uh, calculating Fourier series. Uh, we learned the application of Fourier series in uh, LTI systems. So given a periodic signal input to the LTI, how we can determine its output using Fourier series. Uh, this lecture, we will study its counterpart in discrete time. We will spend much less time on discrete time Fourier series because uh, it can relate it to the continuous time uh, due to their uh, analogies. Uh, okay, let's start. Now we consider a continuous time periodic signal. Instead of x of t, we have x of n. So n is the integer index for discrete time. It's periodic signal, so we can still identify its fundamental period, which is denoted by capital N. And we can define its fundamental frequency, omega zero, which is two pi divided by capital N. This is very similar to the definition of omega zero. In continuous time, it's two pi divided by t. Here we have two pi divided by n. And then we can calculate the Fourier series coefficient. So we still use AK to denote the coefficient for the K term in the Fourier series. There is, so for continuous time, remember that we derive these coefficients exploiting uh, properties of this family called harmonically related exponential signals. For discrete time, we can uh, derive AK in a similar way, except that we change from continuous to discrete time manner. But because the derivation is sophisticated in terms of notation, and it is beyond the uh, level expertise that you are required to gain for this course. So I will skip the derivation process but just to show the result. And you can understand or memorize this result uh, by its analogy to the continuous time coefficient. So AK equals one over N, it's a, this time we have a summation from, okay, the summation is over N terms. Those N terms are indexed by small n from zero to capital N minus one xn exponential minus jk omega zero n. Again, it's similar to the continuous time case because in continuous time we have one over capital T, but this time it's capital N, but it's still the fundamental period. And for continuous time, we have an integral. For discrete time, we have a summation instead of integral. And in continuous time, the integral is over any interval whose length is capital T. And the, here for discrete time, the summation A can be any capital N consecutive integers. So here I wrote small n from zero to capital N minus one. But indeed, if you choose small n to be, for example, one to capital N or N plus one to two N, as long as it's any N consecutive integers, you will find that the summation Will give you the same result. And later you will see the reason. But for convenience, we always choose the uh, most, uh, the, the simplest set of index, which is n from n to capital N minus one. The standard index, if you learned programming right, in C or C, you use this set of index. So xt in continuous time replaced by xn in discrete time, exponential minus jk omega zero t, we change from a continuous time t to discrete time n. So everything is very similar to continuous time. Now after calculating this coefficient, uh, one thing I would like to emphasize that after taking this summation, the integer index n will just disappear, does not affect the result. Therefore, AK, and we know that omega zero is, so given that signal, omega zero is something given and understand it as constant, then AK is only dependent on K. 
which is an integer that indexes the term in the Fourier series. Now with this AK, we can represent our Fourier series. Again, we want to represent the signal X of N. It is a linear combination of exponential JK omega zero N. So in discrete time domains, also the uh, harmonic related exponential signals. And for each term associated with integer K, there is this uh, coefficient AK we calculated above. But here, a key difference between continuous time and discrete time emerges. So I show it more clearly in the next slide. So let's first recall what we had in the continuous time, right? X of T is an infinite sum over terms A, K, and so on. But here, everything looks similar, right? We just changed from T to N, from T to N, but here, the infinite sum becomes finite sum, particular finite sum of capital N terms, right? Why? Here, we just need a finite sum. That's because of the property of this set of functions, exponential jk omega zero n. So now let me elaborate. For continuous time, we have this family of functions, exponential jk omega zero t. Right? And one thing associated with this family of functions is that for every different integer k, this exponential jk omega zero t is a different signal, right? As we increase k, so we, we, we recall that we show this uh, figure on the website. As we increase k, the exponential jk omega zero t is becoming a signal that is oscillating more and more frequently. So we just look different. But that's not for the discrete time case. For the discrete time case, actually we've mentioned this in chapter one. As we increase K, at certain point, the signal exponential JK omega zero N will become the same signal for a smaller K. But in particular, if we consider a signal exponential JK omega zero N for a particular K, and then we consider another signal which is exponential JK plus capital N omega zero N, then these two signals will be just the same signal. And derivation is here given here. Right? We consider this K plus capital N. Notice that omega zero, we define it as two pi divided by N, two pi divided by the fundamental period. So that we can split the two exponentials. The first term is just exponential JK omega zero N. The second term after canceling the capital N becomes exponential J two pi N. So we know that it's just like we rotate this vector on the real and the imaginary plane by any multiples of two pi, which will turn it back to the, to the original vector. So we're just rotating by N circles to we'll come back to the original vector. That's therefore exponential j two pi n equals one, and the signal comes back to exponential j k omega zero. And in a similar way, you can get the conclusion that exponential j k omega zero n is the same signal for all the integers k, k plus minus capital N, k plus minus capital two, two capital N. Therefore, for discrete time, this family of harmonically related exponentials although it seems it has infinite number of members, but due to this identity between some of those members, there are at most n different members. And we can understand this from this example. Now let's look at a particular example with, uh, with uh, capital N equals 16 omega zero, which is two pi divided by 16, which is pi divided by eight. Now we look at the signal exponential JK omega zero N for this particular omega zero. And we first look at its real part, which is cosine K omega zero N using the Euler's formula. 
and its imaginary part is sine k omega zero a, which displays the similar chain. Therefore, I did not show in this slide. So just look at cosine k omega zero a. Actually, this figure you will see it in chapter one. We just change the integer k from zero to 16 and see what this cosine signal looks like, how it changes. First of all, k equals zero, we have a cosine zero omega zero n, which is constantly one for all the n. Uh, by the way, all these signals are displayed over the time axis n. Right? If you look at the uh, uh, show full window. If you look at the horizontal axis indicating time is integer n. And the k is a parameter that controls how the signal looks like. For k equal k equals zero, it's a constant signal over n. When k equals one, so we have cosine one omega zero n, which is cosine pi divided by eight n. And this signal has a fundamental period of 16 because when you change small n by 16, this whole thing inside the brackets will change by two pi. And the, the signal come basically two pi will make the signal to, ch uh, to change from one uh, peak back to the next peak. If you count the numbers of samples, you will find that one, two, three, four, five, eight, and 16. After 16 samples, you will return to the to, to, you will repeat the same pattern again. And if k equals two, so we have cosine two omega zero n, which is cosine pi divided by four n. And you can calculate the fundamental period for this signal cosine pi divided by four n, which is eight, basically after one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight samples you will repeat the next pattern that is the same. And also you can understand as when you increase K, the K omega zero becomes larger and the signal, this cosine signal will oscillate more and more frequently. That's why previously you oscillate every 16 samples, but this time you oscillate one full cycle every eight samples. So it oscillates more frequently. As you increase K, it you know, oscillates more and more frequently and to an extreme where k equals eight. So it oscillates every two samples. But as we further increase k, it will stop oscillating more frequently. But in contrast, it will oscillate less frequently. So in particular, if you look at k equals 12, so we have cosine 12 times pi divided by eight, and which is cosine three pi divided by two n. So in chapter one, we learned how to calculate the fundamental period for this kind of signal. We want to find the smallest integer n that makes two uh, that makes three pi divided by two n changing by any multiple of two pi. And the result is that n equals four. So basically we need n to change by four samples so that three pi n divided by two changes by six pi, which is a multiple two pi. And this case for k equals 12 is exactly the same signal as k equals four. As we further increase k, it will come back to the original case where k equals zero. So from this figure, our observation is that cosine zero omega zero n and the cosine 16 omega zero n are the same signal. If we look at sine signal, it will show a similar trend. So basically sine zero six omega zero n equals sine 16 omega zero. And since the exponential, the complex exponential is cosine plus J sine using the Euler's formula, we have the conclusion that exponential j, zero omega zero n equals exponential j, 16 omega zero. And a similar, in a similar way, you can show that exponential j one omega zero n equals exponential j, 17 omega zero n. So as long as 
these two these two numbers in the exponents has a difference of capital N equals 16, then the two signal will look the same. So two signal being the same means this and this are the same over all the integer time n. And to summarize this conclusion, we are looking at this family of harmonically related exponentials in discrete time. So this family seemingly has infinite number of members, but we can organize those members as this capital N equivalent classes. So equivalent classes means exponential J zero omega zero N and exponential J capital N omega zero N and exponential J two capital N and so on. They are the same signal. And similarly exponential J one omega zero N and J N plus one, J two N plus one, they are the same signal. Or you can even include negative integers. So if we have a negative integer, exponential minus j n omega zero n, actually it will be the same as exponential j zero omega zero n. It will fall in the first equivalent class. At the end of the day, all the infinite number of complex exponentials can be divided into this capital N equivalent classes. And we, it is okay for us to just select a represent, representer from, the, from each equivalent class. And for convenience, we just use the, the first member, right? For exponential J0, J1, J2, up to J capital N minus one. And that determines this format of discrete time Fourier series as a finite sum. Although in principle, it should be written as an infinite sum, but you can always merge those terms that fall in the same, fall in the same equivalent class as one term. And use, you can merge their co corresponding coefficient to use one AK. That's why this is a finite sum. Right, so I got the, this timely question. They ask why AK doesn't need to be merged. Actually, you can understand that as after we merge all the members from the same equivalent class, their corresponding AKs are also merged. And it doesn't matter because those are the same, those members in the same equivalent class are just the same functions. It doesn't matter what are their original coefficients. The only thing matters is the coefficient after the merge. So we only need to calculate this one AK after merging all of them. Okay, so now we have this format of Fourier, discrete time Fourier series. Later I will show example how to calculate that. But let's quickly go through this set of uh, properties for discrete time Fourier series, uh, which again are very similar to what we learned for continuous time case. First, if we have a time reversal of the discrete time sigma, right, we change from x of n to x of minus n, then everything else about the Fourier series keeps the same, except that we change from the coefficient a k to a minus k. Right. This is what we saw for the continuous time case and still holds for the discrete time case. And about time shifting, for the continuous time, we know that if we shift from a signal from x t to x of t minus t zero, then there will be additional exponential minus j k omega zero t zero in the Fourier series. And for discrete time, we are just shifting it by n zero. And this additional term is exponential minus j blah, blah, n zero. So also it's very similar to the continuous time case. So here I didn't mention the 
time scaling property. So I think continuous time time scaling uh, is uh, is very uh, straightforward to understand. But for discrete time, we learned in chapter one, if we are compressing a signal in discrete time, it may involve some loss of the original uh, data points. If we expand the discrete time signal over time, then it involves to add some, adding some information that was missing in the original signal. So this process is non-trivial and I will not mention it in detail. And another property I would like to mention for discrete time Fourier series is linearity. Again, we have two discrete time signals which have the same fundamental period and the same fundamental frequency omega zero. And they have their respective Fourier series as this finite sum. And therefore, if we consider the linear combination of these two signals with constant coefficients A and B, then the Fourier series of this new signal Z of N, we just have the same format, except that the coefficient now becomes the linear combination with the same coefficients A and B, AK and BK for the original signals respectively. And we only showed three properties, time reversal, shifting, and linearity in the slides. And those are the minimum requirement for you to know uh, in this course. And if you are interested, you can refer to uh, chapter seven, uh, three point seven in the textbook to learn about the other properties. Well, some additional remark associated with the uh, discrete time signal compression and uh, expansion. Uh, in practice, of course, we may have the moment uh, the scenario that we have to deal with the expansion. Um, that happens in our communication systems, uh, in a digital, uh, in digital signal processing systems. Uh, well, since we are now at this table, let me point you to this uh, time scaling property. Uh, I will not explain in detail, but basically means if you are expanding a discrete time signal by m times, where m is an integer, then basically. You, are, you need to fill some information because originally for discrete time signal, you have two consecutive integers. But now after the expansion, these two consecutive integers becomes n times for, uh, sorry, m times further from each other. There are at least m minus one points in between that you need to fill in something. And in this example, time scaling, it says if we feel just zero at these new points that emerge, then the Fourier coefficients will become one minus one divided by m a k. So filling zero means we do not add additional information to this signal. Right? Zero is just some dummy thing that we feel does not add information. Uh, in that case, the change of the Fourier series coefficients is simple, just divide AK by M. But for other cases, it's not that simple. Now that we learned discrete time Fourier series, uh, its definition, its format, uh, how to calculate it, and some properties. So how then next we come to the application of for a series. Again, its main application is in discrete time, linear time invariant, LTI systems. Now for this given LTI system, let's assume we have an input X of N, which is a periodic signal. We can find its fundamental period capital N, and therefore we also know its fundamental frequency omega zero, which is two pi divided by N. Again, if we write X of N, in its standard Fourier series form, which is shown here, then we can determine the output of this LTI system. We call it 
the response of the system yn using the Fourier series in a convenient way. yn will have the same format of linear combination, again, summation of finite terms. ak exponential jk omega 0n, they are still the same. And additional term capital H is inserted. So here this capital H, which is exponential, which is dependent on exponential jk omega zero is calculated in the following way. It's an infinite sum of the h of n. So for the discrete time LTI system, it still has a unit impulse response function with its inherent property. This function is given to us as h of n. And this capital H is calculated as infinite sum of h of n weighted by exponential minus jk omega zero. Again, this is similar to the continuous time case. If you recall what happens in the continuous time, we have an integral from minus infinity to plus infinity. H of t exponential minus jk omega zero t dt. So we're just changing t to n and changing the, uh, changing the integral to su summation. And also I would like to emphasize is that the calculation of H is an infinite sum. So the only, uh, so although in the discrete time Fourier, let's come back to the, to this slide, to this slide actually. Although the calculation of Fourier series coefficient AK and the representation representation of Fourier theory itself, both are finite sums. But when we come to capital H, they need to be an infinite sum. So that's a difference. So why it needs an infinite sum? Because if you look at this signal H of N, the unit pulse response signal, it may have different values N for n ranging from minus infinity to plus infinity. So the purpose we use different uh, infinite sum is that we don't want to lose any information associated with h of n. So now let's come to an example uh, about calculating the Fourier series of discrete time signal. So x of n is given here. So over the time axis n, we can see clearly that it's a signal with peer, fundamental period four, right? Because zero, one, two, three, and starting from four, it repeats the same pattern. And for this signal, that's exercise by calculating its Fourier series. For your convenience, I gave the two necessary uh, formulas. One is coefficient, one is the Fourier series itself. Okay. Let's have two minutes for the exercise and then look at the answer together.
OK. So how to calculate the Fourier series? Again, the first already determined fundamental period n equals four. Therefore, omega zero is two pi divided by four, which is pi divided by two. Uh, calculating the Fourier series coefficients. Don't forget this one over n, which is one over four. Finite sum here. Let's take the summation from zero to three because three is n minus one. X of n exponential j k omega zero equals pi divided by two n, which is okay. Here I change from n. Okay, n equals zero to three. I change it to two. But that's because for n equals three, x of three we can read from this figure. X of three equals zero. So basically, the third term in this form. Okay, the term indexed by three just disappears. That's why we only have the summation up to two. And for the, these terms, x of n equals one. So replace x of n equals one, exponential. And how to calculate this? This is a series, a finite series of common ratio. Uh, we've shown the formula to calculate it in chapter one. We showed how to derive that formula. Here we'll just directly apply it. So on the, numer on the denominator is one minus the common ratio. The common ratio is exponential minus jk pi divided by two without this n. This is common ratio. In the numerator is the first term, which is the term where n equals zero, minus the last term, where the last term is n equals two, and multiplies the last term with the additional common ratio. That's why it's two plus one. and simplify a little bit. So anything to the power zero is one. The last term, the common ratio, don't forget is four. But this can only be used when the common ratio is not one. In other words, when k is not zero, because when k equals zero, this common ratio is one, we cannot put it on the denominator. Cannot put zero on the denominator. For k equals zero, the special case is actually easy to discuss because we are adding up from n equals zero to two, every term equals one times one, right? K equals zero, this is potential because one. So we have three terms, zero, one, two, each term equals one, so that's three divided by four. Okay. And the Fourier series, we just write it following the standard format. But here it's a finite sum from zero to three because three equals four minus one, which is capital N minus one. AK exponential plus JK omega zero equals pi over two N. And the AK calculated above is shown here. And we are, we've accomplished this problem. But this answer is good enough, but if you are interested in simplifying further, we can always do it. Uh, we look at the numerator and denominator. From the numerator, we can extract a common factor, exponential minus jk, three divided by four pi. What is left in the brackets is exponential plus jk three point divided by four pi, minus exponential minus jk three divided by four pi. And this term applying the Euler's formula actually applying the corollary of Euler's formula, we know that is a 2j sine, blah, blah. And in the denominator, we also extract the common factor, which is exponential jk pi, four, pi divided by four. Then what is left? Also, we can apply the Euler's formula to it, which is 2j, 2j sine something. And so we, Simplify it a little bit. Yeah. For this discrete time Fourier series, I'm not going to show more examples for the sake of time. And also because uh, the structure, the mathematical structure of Fourier series, I believe we already 
uh, get enough understanding from the continuous time case. So discrete time case, uh, you can just apply it in a similar manner. And this ends up our uh, chapter three, the first series. Now, uh, let me, before the uh, break, let me talk about something related to the exam, to the test on Friday. So I believe we already seen this uh, set of slides on Blackboard. Mm -hmm. On Friday, there's no tutorial. Uh, the test, uh, well, the time for you to answer the question is about 45 minutes, although you have something to do before and after the test. So that's why you it's 9.40 to 11. Uh, count for your 10% of your final grade. Uh, for this test, uh, let's open book, open notes. Uh, notes includes everything that you, I post on Blackboard. If you write some, uh, write your own, whether it's, a, uh, whether it's a sheet or some handwritten notes, you can feel free to use them, but don't use any resource on the web, right? except Blackboard, or any other web browsing is not allowed for this test. No communication between peer students, no discussion, uh, and you are not allowed to use computation software to derive some, equation, some equations or to automatically generate some figure. That's not allowed. All these figures equations, you need to derive it using your brain and hand. Uh, coverage, so chapter one, two, three. For chapter three, we will only uh, cover the continuous time uh, for a series. How many questions? Well, uh, uh, there are small and big questions, but uh, I the TA is uh, designed in a way that it's a reasonable workload for 45 minutes. Don't worry about that. And as I mentioned, it's a combination of Blackboard and Zoom, so we'll need two devices. Uh, Right, the examination, the examination starts at 10 o'clock sharp. Uh, at that time, uh, an assignment with PDF question paper will become available on Blackboard. But before that, you have 20 minutes to uh, registering into the Zoom meeting, just the same Zoom meeting as our regular Friday lecture. And you might need some time to adjust your phone camera so that it looks like so a figure that you will see below. Uh, and this is also the time for image letters to check attendance. And please stay on, the, after the exam starts, please stay on the camera for at least 45 minutes. After 10.45, you can leave the Zoom meeting and uh, free up your uh, phone or iPad or other tablets because you might need use them to take photos with answers. The next 15 minutes, you will upload the answer to that Blackboard. And then at 11 o'clock sharp, the assignment will be due. Later, some, some summation after that will not get any point. Examination ends. So please make sure that you, you are on the video at least more than 40 minutes between 10 to 10.55. But otherwise, you are, you are not under the imagination. Uh, and the, the, the test will just be invalid. Uh, right. Less than 40 minutes, you will be deducted for 50% half of your points. Less than 30 minutes, then you will get 10, zero, uh, zero point for this exam. Yes, the point is for you to join the Zoom meeting only with your phone. And because you will need your uh, computer to look at the question paper on Blackboard. Uh, this is a sample. So what you will look like on the day of that uh, test, basically you, you look at the question paper from your, uh, from your laptop and then your photo is take, your camera photo is taken by the phone camera, your radio and uh, connected to Zoom. And we have three major leaders, including myself and the uh, two TAs. Uh, therefore you can you can receive this invitation to join a breakout room. So each 
uh, TA will manage a breakout room. So when you see this invitation on your uh, on your phone, please accept the please accept it by clicking the join a room. In case of any issue, just like a network connection issue, or you cannot join it, uh, you can uh, email or uh, okay. The quickest way is to call me or call the TA Xuke according to your uh, ID, the range of your ID, so that the we don't we are not overloaded. Okay. Uh, another thing is the midterm. Uh, course and teaching evaluation. So there is a final CTE, but for us to get your uh, timely feedback, there is a midterm CTE, which is performed online this year. The, you basically fill these forms online between this period, October 27 to November the 6th. There are online uh, questionnaires for both the lecture, the tutorial, and the two TAs. So you are uh, advised to uh, fill both of them. Will you give, uh, yes, you can do it with your iPad. So as long as your camera is, sh your, your video is shown on Zoom and you can see the blackboard question, uh, qu question paper, they are okay. Uh, so you, you basically need two devices, but, but uh, uh, either phone or iPad or something. And actual time for uploading, I already said that the uploading time is 15 minutes. I think it's enough because, okay, for, for, for the uh, homeworks, I always advise you that you convert your answer to a single PDF just for the convenience of TA who grade. But for the exam, I understand that you might not have enough time to do so. So for this test, it is okay. You just take photos of your handwritten paper, answer papers, and upload the photos. I believe that will be a quick process, that 15 minutes is, uh, is sufficient. Yes, you need to quit, that, that's right. So you can quit Zoom at 10.55, and then from 10.55 to 11 is your time to upload, right? So the so exam ends at 11. And for the TA questionnaire, uh, I think only, it only specifies the TA number code, whether it's TAA or TAB. But for this class, uh, A is uh, Mr. Xu Ke, uh, B is Ms. Yang Zheyuan. So you have two TAs. Okay, uh, let's have a break and come back 12.30 to continue learning a new chapter, uh, Fourier transform. Okay, I guess everyone is ready to resume the uh, second half lecture uh, today. We will come to a new chapter, the continuous time Fourier transform. So here, this chapter we are learning Fourier transform, which is different from Fourier series. And that difference will be explained through an example later. But first, let's quickly recall what is the key knowledge we learned from last chapter, right? uh, it's Fourier series. The background is that we have a periodic signal input to an LTI system. X of T is that input. We can represent it in the Fourier series form, which is basically a linear combination of infinite number of complex exponentials. And after an LTI system, the output is also the linear combination that takes the same format, except additional term capital H inserted in every term. And that capital H, JK omega zero, can be calculated by taking some integral associated with the H of T unit impulse response of the system. But we always emphasize that both signals, X of T and Y T, need to be periodic for the application of free series. What if X T is aperiodic? 
because periodic signal is just a very special case of all the signals that we will see in practice. And in general, the signal can more likely be aperiodic. And for dealing with aperiodic signal, we, we are motivated to learn Fourier transform. So basically Fourier transform extends the Fourier series in periodic signal to uh, general signals that can be periodic or aperiodic. And in this chapter we focus on continuous time signal. Next chapter, we will learn uh, Fourier transform for discrete time signal. And a detailed outline, we will first define continuous time Fourier transform, how to calculate this transform for a given signal. And we will highlight its relationship with the Fourier series we learned in last chapter, uh, both their difference and their uh, common features. And then similar to the Fourier series, the Fourier transform also has a set of properties that will make it more convenient to calculate uh, the Fourier transform of signal after some time domain operation. And then we will learn how to apply Fourier transform to determine an LTI system response which is the purpose, the motivation for us to learn this tool. Let's begin with the, what is Fourier transform? As I said, we want to deal with an aperiodic signal. So we have an aperiodic signal X of T, which looks like this. For ease of illustration, here we assume that X of T is zero outside of this region minus T1 and T1. In other words, it, this kind of signal is called a signal with a bounded support. But the same result indeed can be derived for general X of T. So we can have X of T that extends infinitely to both left and right, and the same result still hold. So here we have a finite support minus T1 to T1 just for the ease of illustration. So how can we obtain an alternative representation for X of T that is similar to Fourier series? But Fourier series itself in its original form is not applicable because Fourier series is only applicable to periodic signals. Then to construct such an alternative representation, an idea is to first construct a periodic signal that can approximate or can approach this aperiodic signal. What I meant is the following. Let's construct another signal X tilde of T. X tilde of T is a periodic signal. As we can see from this figure, it has fundamental period T, right? This waveform is repeated every time capital T. And on the specific period, which is from minus t divided by two to t by divided by two, the expression of x tilde is exactly the same as x of t, because on this period, x and x tilde are the same. So that gives us the relationship one, x tilde and x t are the same on this period. But outside of this period, they are not the same because X of T is zero outside of this period. X tilde of T has a repeated pattern on this period. And the second relationship, well, needs some intuitive understanding. It says that as the capital T goes to infinity, X tilde of T becomes X of T. So capital T is the fundamental period of X tilde of T. What does it mean when capital T goes to infinity? It means the distance between the two repeated waveforms but just be infinite. In other words, imagine that we start from zero and we want to, we want to approach the next repeated waveform. But since T is infinity, it means we will never reach the next repeated form. Since we never repeat it, it effectively becomes an aperiodic signal where the repeated waveform will never appear again. But that's the intuition 
for t goes to positive infinity. So these two relationships are important in deriving the alternative representation of x of t that we want to have. But basically for x tilde of t, which is periodic signal, from last chapter, we can have a standard procedure to derive its Fourier series, right? Let's quickly go through it. It's infinite sum ak exponential jk omega zero t, where ak can be calculated using, using this integral. This integral row, in principle, it can be taken over any interval whose length is capital T, but here we you select the particular interval from minus t divided by two to t divided by two. And as we said on the last slide, as capital T goes to plus infinity, x tilde of t will become x of t, the aperiodic signal. So let's see what happens to the Fourier series when capital T goes to plus infinity. Hopefully, hopefully it will give us some result that can represent the aperiodic signal x of t. And the capital T goes to plus infinity is equivalent to say omega zero, which is two pi divided by capital T goes to zero. So these two things are equivalent. Okay. Now let's start from this Fourier series coefficient in the periodic signal x of tilde. Uh, this is the standard formula to calculate it. The first step, we can replace x tilde with x. That is because we are taking this integral from minus t divided by two to t divided by two. Recall our relationship one, which can also be observed from this figure. On this region from minus t divided by two to t divided by two, x tilde and x are the same. That's why we can do this replacement without any problem. And then the second step, just replace one over t with omega zero divided by two pi because that's just the definition of, that's just the, the relationship between omega zero and t. And as I said in the last slide, what we want is to let t goes to plus infinity at the same time omega zero equal, uh, goes to zero because this is the way the periodic signal can approach the aperiodic signal. What happens as we take this limit? Okay, let's see what happens when omega zero goes to zero for ak. We put this same limit on the right hand side, right? Just ak equals this, so both sides we take limit and because we take the limit omega zero goes to zero, at the same time, t goes to infinity. So we can replace the upper lower limit of the integral. We can replace the t divided by two with plus infinity divided by two, which is also plus infinity. And same for negative infinity. And this term, which is infinite integral, x of t exponential minus jk omega zero t dt, after taking the integral, time t does not affect the result. The result only dependent on k and omega zero. So we denote it by x of jk omega zero. So here we just introduce a notation capital X jk omega zero for our convenience. And this notation is defined here. Let's copy the key result from last page here. So the key result is the limitation of AK and the new notation that we introduced, capital X. Now let's proceed. The Fourier series of this periodic signal X tilde of T is well defined. Again, for continuous time, it's a infinite sum over time terms indexed by K, AK exponential, plus jk omega zero t. Now, when we take the limit, omega zero goes to zero, this Fourier series will be generalized to Fourier transform for aperiodic signal x of t. Because x of t 
is the limit of x tilde of t as omega zero goes to zero, right, which uses this relationship two. This relationship two says when capital T goes to infinity, the limit x tilde is x. But the capital T goes to infinity is equivalent to say omega zero goes to zero. So this is also correct. And we replace this x tilde of t with the standard Fourier series that is listed above. Just right, put the right hand side here. And we can replace AK with its limit as omega zero goes to zero. What is the limit of AK? It is from the last page. Under this limit, AK can be replaced by this term omega zero to pi capital X, omega zero to pi capital X. Here, let me remark there that there are some mathematical conditions with which this substitution is rigorously equivalent. Because by making this substitution, we're actually replacing a constant term AK with its limit, which is outside of the infinite sum. But it, it's kind of, we are, putting this image from outside to both outside and inside. So to put a limit inside an infinite sum, there need to be some mathematical conditions. I will not mention these conditions, but in this course, we always assume these conditions hold. So this replacement has no problem. Okay. And then the next operation is just for our further convenience. We split one divided by two pi, put it in front of it. We split the omega zero, put it afterwards. afterwards. Everything else keeps the same. So now let's keep this result in mind. We express x of t as this limit of infinite sum involving capital X, involving exponential jk omega zero t. Now we put this result here x of t expressed as the limit of an infinite sum involving capital X, involving exponential jk omega zero t. So I just copy what we got last page. And what the other thing we copy down here is the definition of this notation. So from the last page of last page, but we copy it down here. Now that's the, now we come to a part that is that needs some intuition to understand. So we are looking at a infinite sum. We are looking at a infinite sum. And this summation is over index k. But how we get this summation, we can understand that we have a continuous variable omega. So this horizontal axis is the continuous variable omega. And we define a continuous time smooth function, x of j omega exponential j omega t. So capital X is just the same capital X here. But previously we had in the brackets, jk omega zero, which are multiples of omega zero. Are integer, uh, uh, k are integer. But we replace jk omega zero with a continuous variable j omega. And plus additional term exponential j omega t. So this is a continuous signal that changes continuously with omega. What we do is to partition the omega axis as infinitely many points where each point is a multiple of omega zero. We have k minus one omega zero, k omega zero, k plus one omega zero, and so on, where the k are integers. After this partition, we can read particular points from this smooth curve. Again, this curve is x of j omega e to the power j omega t. And for the particular point, where omega equals k minus one omega zero, the value of this curve, if we map it to the vertical axis, it is x of j k minus one omega zero 
e to the power j k minus one omega zero t, which is shown by this uh, represented by this red dot. And similarly, if we read the value of this smooth curve at k omega zero, we map this black dot to the vertical axis. It val its value is x of j k omega zero e to the power j k omega zero t. Similarly, the blue dot is the value of this smooth curve on k plus one omega zero. That's why every term here has k plus one. Okay. And then we, this actually already look very much similar to the terms inside the infinite sum. But in the infinite sum, there is this omega zero that follows. So where is this omega zero? Notice that omega zero is the width of every rectangle you see here, right? Because from k minus one to k omega zero, the difference is just one omega zero. So omega zero is the width of this rectangle. So if we multiply the height of this rectangle with the width of this rectangle, what we get is the area of this rectangle. So inside of this infinite sum, every term actually corresponds to an, every term actually corresponds to an area of a rectangle. And this infinite sum says for all the integers k from minus infinity to plus infinity. Therefore, as we calculating this infinite sum, it is like calculating all the, the total area of all these rectangles. On this figure, I only show three of them. But you, you can extend this kind of sample infinite to the left and to the right. So we're adding all of them up. And now don't forget we have a limit as omega zero goes to zero. What does it mean? It means, so omega zero is the width of this rectangle. As it goes to zero, every, the width of every rectangle just becomes infinitely close to zero. And we have thinner and thinner rectangles, which is a finer and finer approximation of the total area covered by this smooth curve. And we learned in our calcula calculus class. So this total area of those rectangles as it becomes finer and finer, becomes thinner and thinner. It defines the Riemann integral, which is the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of this smooth curve, right? This, this part is the smooth curve, this black smooth curve d omega, which is the total area covered by this smooth curve. So from this intuitive understanding, what we have is that the right hand side of this x of t, this limit of infinite sum becomes this infinite integral. So this limit infinite sum is uh, this infinite integral so that we can replace this part with this integral. The result is here, x of t, don't forget this one divided by two pi, one divided by two pi is copied down here. This limitation of infinite sum is replaced by this integral. And also notice that we define the capital X just as a notation, right? When it is k omega zero, it means we're taking this integral with omega zero in the exponent. We can substitute k omega zero on both sides with anything, as long as we are, as long as we are substituting left hand side, right hand side at the same time. So we substitute the k omega zero with a continuous omega that gives us the first equation. x of j omega is this integral. k omega zero replaced by omega. 
Yes. Some of you might already find that after those equivalent substitution and by using this uh, limit of omega zero goes to zero, the integer index k basically disappears. Right now we are looking at what is left in the blue box only associated with continuous time t, only associated with a continuous variable omega. No integer index in these expressions. So these two equations, this pair of equations. Oh, okay. Why? Why is this? So, so, so uh, actually what I've been doing is to explain why this k disappears, right? For the second equation, the integer index disappears just because we use this figure. We approximate the infinite sum. So the infinite sum approaches the integral as omega zero goes to zero. So that's why integer disappears in the second one. And the integer disappears in the first one just because we introduce capital X as a notation. Since it's a notation, so we can replace the k omega zero with anything. We can replace it with zero, we can replace it with one, replace it with 1.5, or we can replace it with any variable omega, regardless it's continuous or discrete. But anyway, this pair of equations is the Fourier transform. Oh, okay, okay. The first equation is the Fourier transform. So we see that x of j omega is a Fourier transform of small x of t. And vice versa, small x of t is the inverse Fourier transform of x of j omega. So this pair of transform and the inverse transform involves two continuous variables. One is t, which we understand as time. One is omega, which we understand as frequency. So why it's a frequency, I will elaborate it later. But for this pair of transform, we use some notation for it. We can denote capital X of J omega as F of X of T, which means the Fourier transform of X T. And vice versa, X of T is F inverse X of J omega. So it's the inverse Fourier transform. Or we can simply represent the relationship between X of T and the capital X of J omega using this way. So they are mutually Fourier transform and inverse transform. So we put this F on the double-sided arrow. And the Fourier transform is actually transforming a signal X of T in the time domain to a signal capital X of J omega on the frequency domain. So why we can understand this continuous variable omega as a frequency? We can understand it by connecting it back to the Fourier series we learned in the last chapter. So for Fourier series of a periodic signal, X tilde of T, since it's periodic, then there is a well-defined fundamental period and a well-defined fundamental frequency, omega zero, which is a positive number. And in that case, x tilde of t can be represented as an infinite weighted sum of exponential jk omega zero t. And actually this exponential jk omega zero t itself is a signal with the fundamental frequency k omega zero t, right? Because it's a real part is called sine k omega zero t, imaginary part of sine k omega zero t. So again, let's, recall the figure we see on the website. As k becomes larger and larger, its frequency k omega zero t becomes, uh, k omega zero becomes larger. So the signal oscillates more frequently. So k omega zero is the frequency for each of the signal that compose, composes this Fourier series. Now let's, make omega zero infinitely small so that it approaches zero. 
in this process, the periodic signal approaches a periodic signal x of t. The weighted sum becomes a weighted integral because the time interval between consecutive samples are infinitely small. So that's why the summation goes to integral. And as the gap between two consecutive samples becomes infinitely small, we are changing, we, we gradually change from discrete frequencies, so k omega zero for integer k to a frequency omega that changes continuously, which can be seen from this axis, right? So originally for periodic signal, we just have samples of k omega zero for integer k. But as the distance between every two consecutive samples becomes smaller and smaller, we are looking at a continuum of omega. We can, in other words, it's, it's, we can no longer distinguish the, this k omega zero and next the k plus one omega zero, just a change is continuous. So this limit case is the Fourier transform. And that's why the omega can also be understood as the frequency. It's some frequency that changes in the way that's not distinguishable from this k and next k. And some additional remark for this Fourier transform. The Fourier transform, either x of t or capital X of j omega, they are the description of the same signal, just in different domains. So both sides are describing the same signal. And therefore, it's kind of equivalence. They're just like analogous to this, to this word Hong Kong that you see. You can represent it as in the domain of Chinese characters with re, re, which reads Xiang, or you can represent it in the domain of Romanian alphabets, which is its English name Hong Kong. But both words are described in the same city, the same objective. And the Fourier transform is analogous to this Chinese English translation here. Now we have some time left. Let's look at a first example to calculate a Fourier transform of a continuous time signal. We are given this signal. It is exponential minus t absolute value. So first, how to understand this signal? Since it involves the absolute value, we need discussion whether t is positive or negative. When t is positive, then absolute value is t itself. We have exponential minus t. So on the right half of this, uh, so, so for t, t positive, it's decaying because we are looking at exponential minus t. And for t less than zero, t absolute value becomes minus t. And those two minus sign cancel, so we have exponential t. So for the negative part, we have exponential t, which is increasing. So x of t is a, actually it's an even signal that's symmetric over zero. For this kind of signal, let's calculate its Fourier transform. Again, we have two different ways to denote Fourier transform, f of x t or x of j omega. So they are the same and is defined as this integral. The result should be a function of continuous frequency omega. Now let's have two minutes to calculate, try by it by yourself. Right. Now let me repeat it, uh, why it's exponential t. Because when t less than zero, absolute value becomes minus t. And we have two minus signs which cancel each other. Whether the Fourier transform always have frequency? 
why it always has frequency, right? Because Fourier transform, it is meant to be a representation of the signal on the frequency domain. Okay, thanks. Sure, sure. Uh, well, the, the, the understanding of frequency domain is, we well, need some effort to understanding that, especially when you, when you, when it is a continuous frequency, because when the frequency is multiples of some omega zero, then it's still easy to understand, right? Because k omega zero as k increases, we know that just like a sinusoidal signal that is oscillating more and more frequently. But what is a continuously changing frequency? That that's that's. Uh, a little bit abstract. Uh, sorry, I cannot uh, explain it using very, very uh, concrete example. I just need abstract understanding. Right. Uh, here, I know some of you might still have difficulty understanding it. Say we have a negative number t equals minus two then the uh, absolute value of t is two, right? Exponential minus absolute value is exponential minus two. It's exponential t itself because we start from t equals minus two. Okay, let's look at the calculation of Fourier transform. We start from this integral because this x of t has two different expressions on two different regions. So to calculate an integral, we also need to split the integration interval as two different regions that divided at point zero. From minus infinity to zero, the expression is exponential to the power t. From zero to plus infinity, the expression is exponential to the power minus t. So to calculate the first term, we have one minus j omega as the coefficient before t. And when calculate the integral, we pull it outside, we eliminate the integration symbol. We need an additional factor that need to be put on the denominator. We can do that safely because of the non-zero non real part and the imaginary part. So this is not zero. And what is left is, is this exponential we take its difference from lower limit minus infinity and upper limit zero. For upper limit zero, the result is just one, which is straightforward. For lower limit minus infinity, we've shown this with a figure in the last chapter. Because the magnitude or the modulus of this complex number, exponential one minus j omega t, its modulus is exponential t. Therefore, as t goes to minus infinity, the modulus of this number goes to zero. Regardless of how its angle changes, the number itself must be zero. So the second term in the numerator is zero. We have one minus zero. That's why we only have one left in the numerator. And similarly for the second term, the coefficient we need to extract is minus one plus j omega, right? Because minus one minus j omega. So minus one plus j omega. And what is left in the numerator, again, we take this difference between zero and plus infinity. Since for this exponential, its magnitude is exponential minus t. As t goes to plus infinity, it diminishes to zero. And therefore, for the numerator, the first term is zero, and then the second term minus one. The minus sign on numerator and denominator can be canceled, so we have plus one over one plus j omega. And this is the Fourier transform of uh, x of t.
it is okay if you just leave the answer in this way. It's already a function of omega itself. But if you are interested, you can further simplify it by multiplying the two denominators. And one denominator comes to the numerator, the other denominator comes to the other numerator. After canceling the j omega minus j omega, we have a simpler form. Numerator is two, denominator just one plus omega square because the imaginary term just cancel each other. Notice that this is plus omega square, right? Because if you look at minus j omega times j omega, we have minus j square omega square. And j square equals minus one by the definition of an imaginary number. So that's why this is plus sign. So the second term, uh, the second example is a little bit long. Uh, I don't think I have enough time to finish it in the seven minutes left. Let's have an early release today. And for the test on Friday, focus on the part before continuous time Fourier series. Okay. Okay, uh, that's the end of the lecture today. Good luck with your test on Friday, and uh, we, will, uh, we will. I will see you in the lecture next Wednesday. Thanks. See you. Sure. Thank you. <laughs>